Have you ever read about millionaire habits and thought to yourself, I should build these habits to be successful in life? Well, I study a lot of successful people and a lot of habits that I have adopted over years, like the habit of continuous learning, is the habit of successful people. But here's the catch. One size does not fit all. So the habits that might work for one person might not work for another. In today's video, I will share with you five habits of successful people that I have tried and they haven't worked for me. Please note that all these experiences are personal and they may or may not resonate with you. Some might even be controversial, especially the last one. So let's get started. So the first habit that I want to talk about that did not work for me is the 5 a.m. club. The concept became widely popular when Robin Sharma wrote a book about it in 2018. It presents a framework for achieving success and fulfillment by adopting a morning routine that starts with waking up at 5 a.m. Now, this habit is set in the belief that the first hour after waking up, also called as the golden hour, is the most critical time of your day for personal growth and setting the tone for the rest of the day. Now, by investing this time in yourself and focusing on your physical, mental, and emotional well-being, you can boost your productivity. The 2020-20 formula is the foundation of the 5 a.m. club, and it suggests that the first hour of your morning should be divided into three 20-minute segments. The first 20 minutes are for exercise and physical activity to energize your body. The next 20 minutes are dedicated to reflection, journaling, and meditation to nurture your mind. And the final 20 minutes are dedicated for learning and personal growth to get the transformational results. After hearing a lot about this 5 a.m. habit and how people got transformational results through it, I really wanted to give it a try. Let me begin with a disclaimer though. I'm not a morning person. My creative energy is at its peak at the night time. The first time I tried this habit was in 2020. It was during COVID, the kids were in online school, I was working from home. It just seemed like the right time to give this habit a try. I promised myself that I'll give myself 21 days as a fair chance and see if this works for me. Now, whenever I try adopting a new habit, I like to set a positive intention around it because I truly want to successfully adopt the habit and see the results. In my research, I found that many people who successfully adopted this habit focused on going to bed early so that they could get up early. So instead of putting an alarm for 5 a.m., they would put an alarm to wind down starting 8 p.m., sleep between 9 to 10 a.m., and then wake up at 5 a.m. I did the same. I set out my workout clothes, created a space for easy access to my journals and meditation videos in the closet so that I don't wake up my husband and was ready to embark on this journey. The first day felt great. I was able to wake up on time, felt like I accomplished a lot in the first hour because I exercised, I did my journal, I did my reading. So when the entire house was sleeping, I was able to accomplish all these things. I wanted to take the first week easy because I didn't want to overwhelm myself with a new schedule. By afternoons though, I started feeling my energy declining and my mind was foggy. After the first week, I noticed that my creative energy was taking a hit. Now, my creative energy is high in the afternoon and in the evening time. But because I was waking up at 5 a.m., my body was tired by the evening and so was my mind. I had headaches and I was snappy with everyone around me because I wasn't getting enough sleep. Over years, I have figured out that I need at least 8 to 9 hours of sleep every day for peak performance. So after trying for about 3 weeks, I decided to drop the idea. I instead carved out a routine that works in alignment with my energy cycle and allows me to be flexible as needed. My schedule still involves walking 12,000 steps every day, 30 minutes of learning time and meditation. It just doesn't happen at 5 a.m. in the morning. The second habit that I want to talk about is the mentor myth. When I started my corporate job, 
about 20 years ago, everyone advised me to find mentors who could help me grow in my corporate journey. I had read about successful people having a pool of mentors. So that's what I did. But while mentors were great to bounce off my ideas, they didn't help me get promoted. Over years, I realized that what we need is sponsors. We need sponsors to succeed. And there's a big difference between mentors and sponsors. A mentor talks to you while a sponsor talks about you. We need people who can be our cheerleaders in the rooms where we are not present. So I ditched the mentors and I found sponsors. I invested my time in finding sponsors, in building relationships, and then leveraging these sponsors to move forward in my career. Sponsors helped me grow in my career. They opened doors for new opportunities and helped me create multiple streams of income. Today, I coach leaders at global companies like Microsoft and Oracle on how to find and leverage sponsors. I talk about how to build a pool of sponsors in my Amazon bestseller book, Fast Track Your Leadership Career, and in my LinkedIn learning course, Finding Sponsors. The next habit that did not work for me at all is drinking one gallon of water every day. Now, there's a lot of recommendation in the social media, on the internet, about drinking one gallon of water, and this recommendation is promoted for its potential health benefits. Now, I understand that adequate hydration is essential for various bodily functions and overall well-being. Water plays such a critical role when it comes to our digestion, circulation, temperature regulation, and the transportation of nutrients and oxygen to the cells. I have friends who swear by one gallon intake of water and they measure their intake every day, but I had never focused on it because I like drinking water. I don't need it to be flavored or carbonated. Plain old tap water at room temperature is delicious to me. A couple of years ago though, I realized that I wasn't drinking enough water in the business of the day. So I decided to get myself a one gallon water bottle with an intent to drink a gallon of water every day. My co-workers and friends had seen the benefits from drinking one gallon of water every day. So I decided to give it a try. The first day I drank about three liters of water and I felt sick. The next day I tried getting closer to a gallon but my head hurt and I felt nauseous. I gave it another two days, but I couldn't take it anymore and dropped the idea. Now, after talking to my doctor, I realized that there is no scientific evidence around drinking one gallon of water. The ideal daily water intake can vary from person to person, depending on factors like age, gender, activity level, climate, and overall health. While one gallon of water a day might be suitable for some individuals, it might not work for others. In fact, drinking too much water, especially beyond your body needs, can lead to a condition that's called hyponatremia, which is characterized by low sodium levels in the blood. This can be dangerous and cause symptoms such as headache, nausea, and in severe cases, even seizures and coma. So one gallon of water a day was crossed off my list. I still focus on drinking about 64 ounces of water every day, which works best for my body. The next one on my list is the low carb diet. We all want to be best version of ourselves. As we grow older, our metabolism decreases and we burn calories at a lower rate, which often shows up as weight gain. Yes, that happened to me too. Based on my conversation with some friends and health experts, I decided to give low-carb keto diet a try. The ketogenic diet or the low-carbohydrate high-fat diet has gained popularity over years because of its potential to help individuals lose weight and improve certain health markers. Now, it's characterized by significant reduction in carbohydrate intake, about 5-10%, to 10 typically replacing carbohydrates with fat as the primary source of energy for your body. Now, after following this diet for a few days, I started having severe headaches. Based on my research, some people experience symptoms which are known as keto flu, which may cause fatigue, headache, and nausea. My headaches were so bad that I decided to dish the diet and instead focus on including 
complex carbohydrates like whole grains in my diet and reducing the portion size to help with my metabolism. And as I mentioned, I kept the most controversial one for the last, the office table setup. Now, I am one of those few people in this world who like to work from our bed. Sitting on a chair at a desk makes me very uncomfortable. As a kid too, I used to get scolded by my parents for studying in the bed. I used to do my homework in the bed. I was used to memorize and prepare for tests in my bed. I've read theories about how you're more productive when you work from a desk. But for me, it's all about comfort. I love having all my books and resources on my bed. My ability to put my legs under a cozy blanket and work. So I invested in a bed office setup that works for me. I consulted with my chiropractor and an ergonomist to get a proper back support and a laptop table that allows me to work comfortably and be productive without compromising on my posture and health. As I mentioned before, these habits might still work for you. They just didn't work for me. Let me know if you have tried building any of these habits and how they have worked out for you. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment and hit on the notification bell icon to get access to my videos as soon as they are released. Have a successful week. Bye-bye.